You are listening to audio from the Decidedly Podcast. This episode is a highlight clip from this week's full episode. To listen in on the complete conversation, see the show notes for the link to the complete show. You can help us out by leaving us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate every bit of your support. I'm Morgan McKittrick, your producer, and this is Decidedly. When you were struggling to get waivers yeah. based on physical attributes, and, and, and there are some limitations where you really wouldn't want a waiver yeah. beyond, yeah. right? Were you concerned that there was this barrier because of stature, or did you think, oh, you know, this is because I'm I'm a woman? Or were there other sort of institutional barriers you had to get through to be able to be a combat oh, pilot? Oh, well, for sure. That, so flight? when I went off to the Air Force Academy, there were, were institutional barriers, but I didn't think the height limit, you know, necessarily, I didn't focus on it like it was a female-male thing. I mean, you could be frustrated by that, but they built the aircraft long before I was there trying to get my pilot Training, so you wanna you wanna rail against the things you can change. Which, if we're talking about good decision making, you know, focus on the things you can change, not the things you can't change. Yeah. I can't change how the planes were built, but I can only change the path I take in order to try and have an opportunity to fly them. Uh, but when I when I entered the Air Force Academy, I wanted to be a doctor. I was motion sick when I was a kid, and I had no desire to be a pilot. And I found out for the first time in my life that I couldn't be something just because I was a woman. It was against the law at the time for women to be fighter pilots. And I just, I couldn't believe it. I grew, I was blessed. I grew up in a family where I was told I could be anything I wanted to be. And I have a little bit of a change agent, entrepreneurial slash rebellious spirit in me, which you'll discover over the course of the hour. And so I channeled that in a way where I was like, what do you mean I can't do that just because I'm a girl? And it just pissed me off. And I just decided, you know what? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to become a fighter pilot. I'm going to be the first woman fighter pilot. And people laughed at me. They were like, you know, it's against the law, Martha. And my response was, we live in America. Laws change. So I'm not going to let my dream die. Uh, I wouldn't have said it like this at the time. But the, the, the kind of the approach I took was keep the dream of my heart. Don't have a chip on my shoulder bloom where I'm planted, keep excelling, keep looking for opportunities that maybe the, you know, the door was going to blow open, persevere, keep growing in your skills and, and, and things that you would need in order to be a good pilot. And, you know, the door finally opened. It was nearly 10 years later. I had nothing to do with the change, but I had the right, you know, at that point, grit and attitude and qualifications and timing, which is often really important in life. Uh, that when the door opened, I was ready and I was ready here, you know, too, where I was like dreaming and persevering towards it. So yeah, there were severe barriers. I didn't in that case have anything to do with the change, but I had to do with, you know, I was, my part was to be postured and ready when the change happened to say, you know, send me, I'll go through first. Did you have a sense that that change was happening? Was that fairly well broadcast? Uh, so, you know, my years at the Air Force Academy, no. Like it was so far from anybody's thinking that it would ever change. They then sent me to Harvard for grad school for two years. And honestly, my first I think you think about good and bad decision making, sometimes we make good decisions for the wrong reasons, right? So <laughs> so I'm trying to like I'm trying to get my waiver for my height and then I my hand was broken. So even when I got it for my height, my hand, I lost it for my hand. It's a very long story. I talk about this in my book, <laughs> Dare to Fly. But it was talking about persevering and my window was closing. I had withdrawn from other, you know, from medical school process and I was running out of options. I just was singularly focused on pilot training. And I finally applied for a scholarship. The The one-star general was like, Martha, like you need to wake up. Like you gotta apply for the road scholarship, apply for a scholarship, your grades are great. You know, these are great opportunities. And I was like, I don't wanna go to 17th grade. I'm tired of school, I wanna go fly. <laughs> and so I finally applied to the road scholarship. I mean, I can admit this now, with the main focus of like, I'm trying to buy time to get into pilot training. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, it's just something to do right yeah. so i end up you know i get there i make the regional finals of the roads and then they give me this scholarship to harvard so i go off to harvard but again i'm so 
uh, I mean, I laugh at it now, like, okay, I'm here to study what, you know, because my mindset was I'm here to buy time, you know, for getting into pilot training. So I had this great experience. Yeah, it was amazing. Then I went to pilot training. And when I was in pilot training, Desert Storm happened. And then Congress repealed the law while I was in pilot training. So I thought, I'm going to be able to pick a fighter. And then the Pentagon said, just because it the, the law changed, we still are not changing the policy. And I was like, ah. So I I thought for sure it was still going to well, change. Well, what does that mean? Like, just because there was no what longer against the law, they that? can still say that they don't want to do it. It's not their policy. So whatever. It, you know, we have this. Oh, so they changed the law, but not the policy. Oh, yeah. okay. The, the, so the law changed saying saying that no the Air Force could allow it. But the military, across okay. Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, they just refused to open it up. But I just had a sense, like, it's going to change soon. And so that decision that I made a critical decision at that moment. Okay. I was graduating near the top of my class. I had a lot of great assignments I could have chosen from, uh, that would be flying cargo planes or tanker planes. But once I went to fly in one of those other major weapon systems, they were never going to cross me over to fighters. And so I decided to be a T-37 instructor pilot in Del Rio, Texas, because I felt like it was going to still give me an opportunity to transition to fighters after that assignment was over. And it was buying me more time, just like grad school was buying me more time for the change to happen. So I picked this assignment, which most people were shocked. They were like, why would somebody graduating so high in their class pick a T-37 to Del Rio, Texas? Like it just was, but I was keeping, you know, and it wasn't an easy decision, by the way, not, not an easy decision. I have, we don't have time to tell the whole story. It was made in the moment, which I would not advise, but it, my gut told me, keep the dream alive, pick this, keep keep building your expertise as a pilot. It's going to change soon. And it paid off. A couple years later, I got a phone call from a general at the Pentagon saying, we're about to change the policy. We looked back to um, all the women who graduated since the law was changed who earned a fighter, but we simply couldn't pick one because we had ovaries. And we're not flying another major weapon system. And it's come down to seven of you. Are you still interested in being a fighter pilot? And I was like, hell yes, of course I am. So it, it all, all those decisions to buy myself time to keep the dream alive paid off. So I'm not saying I'm Esther. Here's the point, right? Anytime you hear a story, things can resonate with you, whether it's a story or scripture. Her uncle who raised her says to her, can it be that you were put in this position for such a time as this? That's Esther 414. And when I read that verse, it just spoke to me in a very profound way. Can it be that I've been given this opportunity to go to the Air Force Academy, go to Harvard, to go to pilot training, to be in the right place at the right time when the door opened so I could be in that first group to go, become a fighter pilot and the first to deploy. So I would have this platform to speak for these young enlisted women who don't have that voice. Could it be, this has nothing to do with me achieving my dreams and goals. This is about me being put in a position to be able to make a difference for others. And I'm that sounds pretty heavy, but that's how it hit me, honestly. It was like, ah. So I had to start making decisions over the eight years, whether I was going to stand up and continue to try and bring this change about or whether I was going to do what was more comfortable and easy for me. And every time I had to go back to that, can it be that you were put in this position for such a time as this? So I tried to get a change within the Department of Defense. Years later, they ordered me over to Saudi Arabia, threatened to court martial me if I didn't put the burqa on myself. I thought it was my last chance to try and um, bring about change within the system because it was a US military policy only, by the way. Um, and when they just failed to do anything about it, I decided to go to the other branches of the government. So um, what? not an easy decision to be like, I, at that point I was promoted four years ahead of my peers. I was you know, on track to be a senior leader in the Air Force and now I'm suing the Secretary of Defense. You know? So not easy, but it came from What's the right thing to do? This is part of my decision-making process here, right? What's the right thing to do? What's the next right thing to do? And don't ever walk by a problem. Like these are all parts of kind of how I live my life. If you're ever complaining about something, look yourself in the mirror, what are you gonna do about it? And so 
I just had to keep making the next right decision. And the next right decision after six plus years into this was to get the branches of the government that have oversight of the branch that was failing to address this issue, which I thought was wrong on so many levels. I mean, our women were sitting in the backseat of the car and you know, wearing full Muslim garb and the taxpayers were paying for it. I, I just believed it was unconstitutional. And, you know, in the end, um, you know, it took, took eight and a half years, but uh, we were, I was able to prevail. I tell this, I tell all this in my, in my book, by the way, Dare to Fly, uh, in greater detail. Uh, but ultimately it goes back to what's the next right thing to do, right? And could it be- And what do you mean by what's the next right thing to do? Uh, what I mean is, so in that pro- in the eight year process, I first thought, um, raising it up the chain of command, I thought it was a State Department thing. So I thought I had to go up to the Secretary of Defense and over to the Secretary of State. And that's the path I thought I had to take. And um, then I realized, I discovered through all my research, it was actually the U.S. military doing it to itself, to its to our own people. And so I was still trying to like how to figure out, okay, I tried to take a path up the chain of command and it got thwarted. So then it's like, what, what's the next rate? Like, what else can okay. I do? What, yeah, what, what now? now? Like, where else can yeah, I go? Don't accept failure yeah. on, so on that first original decision. And this gets into, again, other ingredients, I think, of good decision-making is you got to be creative. If you keep going up the same hill and you keep, you know, keep getting thwarted in your success, you have to look for another way. You have to think about being creative. You have to figure out what allies do I need? How else can I approach this? What other opportunities may come my way? Having a kind of a, an agile mindset of also just creativity and curiosity of like, how else can we solve this? And I didn't immediately, if somebody told me I was going to sue the Secretary of Defense on the the first day when I saw that newsletter, I would have told them that they were crazy. But the, six years later, it was the next right thing to do. Once the you know Department of Defense just refused to change and they just dug in in their bureaucracy, um, and so I just had to keep asking that, like, what else? What other paths can I take? And presented with other options, what's the next obvious choice? Oh, all along the way, there was one choice to just stop and give up. But that, to me, if you ask, what's the next right thing to do? If you think something's wrong, like you don't give up, you just persevere and you look for other ways and other people and other allies and other approaches to be able to be successful. Thanks for making the great decision to listen into this week's episode highlight. If you want more of what you just heard, see the show notes for the full episode. As always, for the latest decision-making tips, find us on decidedlypodcast.com or on Instagram at decidedlypodcast. And be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter from the link in the show notes. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review as well. We read all of your comments, so if you learned some decision-making tips today, let us know. Until next time, this is Decidedly. Insights, advice, and comments provided by Sean Smith, Singer Smith, and speakers identified as part of the Decidedly podcast should not be considered recommendations. Speakers who are not identified as members of Decidedly are expressing their own opinion, and their statements should not be construed as reflecting the views of the Decidedly team. This podcast was produced solely for informational purposes, not personalized advice.